So you get the idea. Nankara was absolutely, at this point, unconcerned with what a single person could do. He just wanted to write music as wild and fast as he possibly could. And he continued to do so. Before we continue on Nankara's player piano music, it's worth knowing a little bit what it was like to write for player piano. So the player piano looks somewhat like this. It was an upright piano, not a grand. But it had a contraption where the music stand would go that would advance a continuous spool of paper. And to write a note on a player piano, you would punch a hole in the paper, and air would blow through the hole and activate a lever, which would hit the appropriate key. And you did this both for the individual notes as well as their dynamics, how loud they would play. On the left-hand side of the player piano, there was a lever, which would punch the hole. So when you wanted to write a note, you would slide your paper to where it goes, you'd advance it some increment with a, with a crank, and then you'd adjust a little hole puncher and pull your lever, and that would do one thing. So, when you punch one hole, it makes one very, very short staccato note. To make a note longer, you have to punch so many holes in succession that they would overlap. But that might partially explain why Nankaro wrote very, very little music that had long notes in it. It took an enormous amount of effort even to write one single long note. Nankaro, in fact, developed an overdeveloped left bicep because as he sat at this player piano, he constantly had to crank out note after note while he would pencil in the correct note with his right hand. So Nankaro would write these pieces that would take him months to just write. After he thought of the piece, it would just take a process of months to actually get the player piano to play it. So he really wanted to trick out his player piano so they did exactly what he wanted. Player pianos ordinarily sound more or less like a piano you're used to hearing. But as you might have noticed, Nankaro's player pianos did not sound at all like this very nice instrument we have here. Nankaro would be horrified by the instrument in front of you. He wanted an instrument that was as far the opposite of the Spazioli piano as you can get. Modern pianos emphasize a long sound with a lot of blue. When I play this note as short as I can, it still lasts for quite a while, even if you take your hand off of it. Nankaro wanted to imitate the sound of a harpsichord, so the sound would be as dry and as non-resonant as it possibly could be. To do that, what he did was he had two player pianos, on one player piano, he took all the hammers and he wrapped a thin sheet of metal around them so that the hammers would, instead of striking the keys with felt that would sink in and have this long, blooming sound, have a sound that would be very sharp and decay immediately. On the other one, to make it even more dry and even more sharp, he stuck thumbtacks in the end of each hammer. So both of Nankara's player pianos had these modifications to make them sound like what you just heard. The other thing he did is that player pianos usually, they could play very fast, but basically there was some smallest amount that you could advance your paper by. So there was some smallest unit beyond which you couldn't make your piece any faster or any more finely graded. Nankaro built his own mechanism for advancing the paper so that if he wanted to, there was absolutely no limit to how continuously and how finely he could divide up his paper. And later on in his career, when he began writing pieces that used notes that there is no representation for in music notation, values that don't have any commensurate tempo at all, he needed to actually use that continuous adaptation. So that was the an early part of Nankaro's player piano music. That was called uh, play, Player's at Piano Study Number 3, which was his boogie woogie suite, as you heard the, uh, uh, the bass line going in that classic figuration. But most of Nankaro's player piano music is much more abstract. The first technique I want to talk about that Nankara used was called isorhythm. Iso meaning same rhythm. So in isorhythm, which is a technique from the Middle Ages, Nankara would separate the way the melody works from the way the harmony works. So let's say he had a melody in which each part of the melody was seven notes long. So we could have one, two, three, four, five, six units of the melody repeating and each time the melody repeats, it has seven notes. But what if he had a rhythm in which there were six notes? Then, by the time the melody finished, the rhythm would not have quite finished yet. So with a six-note rhythm, he would have this cycle so that the rhythm would not quite be done. Only by the time the melody had finished itself six times, and the rhythm had finished itself seven times, with the two actually lined back up together after 42 notes total. This is a technique that's found in Indian raga all the time. The tabla player, the drums, will play at a slightly different beat structure and cycle than sitar player, but after some number of cycles, they'll come back together. 
So just like everything else Nick Cairo did, he did this in a very fast and complicated way. So I'll demonstrate isorhythm with a somewhat simpler example, using the one I just did up there. So let's say we have a melody that sounds like this. Instead of combining that with a common medieval rhythm, he combined that with the rhythms of jazz and the blues. So a Nankara rhythm would be like... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the pattern would be... And then we'll be back where it started. So here's the rhythm again. even with something that complicated. What Nankara always liked to do is then put it against itself at a different speed altogether. And eventually, Nankara would have these patterns that wrap around each other, and so after some long cycle, a big section of this piece would be finished. So let me play a piece for you of Nine right now that uses ice rhythm as its organizational technique and yet sounds more or less out of the tradition of the blues. except he's creating it through using a medieval technique to ensure that the patterns never quite settle down and never quite line up. 